Yeah, please. Yeah, Phil, what we're going to Um, did pass out the portion of the mission statement from our church on our royal vaca vacation. Royal vacation. Uh, it sounds like a cruise. Sounds like a cruise ship or something. <laughs> Um, our royal vocation, uh, and you can just look at that. I don't, I don't think I want to go over it. The, I think the the interesting thing about this is adding um, the commitment to our church to beautify worship and the architecture, the environment of the sanctuary. That's something different, it's, of course. And the way we do shepherding with with parish groups and stuff is all there. I mean, that doesn't really concern mm -hmm. you, but that, I'll just give you that just to show you how we're working working that out, that dimension of our ministry. Okay. So now let's move on to the prophetic calling uh, and consider, at least in summary fashion, our prophetic duties. We are a company of prophets. Now, you've probably heard um, a number of times from Steve um, and maybe from others that we have a very anemic understanding of prophecy and the role of prophets. Anemic in the sense that we leave out key biblical dimensions of prophecy. And some of this is because prophecy has been pretty much reduced in some circles to predicting the future. What do you need, Steve? This, this one? Yeah. The prophet one? Yeah. No. Yeah, the last one. Gotcha. I was in a train of thought and you just composed <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> um, so, lots of times prophecy is reduced to predicting the future. Uh, some of this is because also um, our battles, the battles that our evangelical fathers fought, in um, the 20th century, back in the 20th century, against liberalism and the attack on the notion of divine revelation, um, that has given us a somewhat anemic view of prophecy, or at least skewed view. When I was in seminary in the mid-'80s, most of our classes on Bible books were taken up with the attacks of modernists against the authorship and inspiration of Old and New Testament texts. So we emphasized almost exclusively in our classes the very true and important fact that God actually spoke to and through men and women in the past with infallible knowledge and direction. He spoke to us through Abraham, Moses, Samuel, David, and the rest, and then Matthew and Peter, and to name just a few. But the prophetic scriptures are indeed the final product of God's infallible revelation of himself and his will for all of humanity and creation. And it's that dimension of prophetic activity which is fundamental, but which was overemphasized because of our war, our battle for the Bible, basically. Um, and, and, uh, and, and that's why there's such an emphasis, even, even back 20 years ago, on the fact that prophecy has ceased, the cessation of prophecy. Because, and that was the big thing. If you ever talked about the church as, or as a company of prophets or anything, everybody kind of immediately, their hackles got up like, well, prophecy has ceased. Well, what kind of prophecy? Well, the prophecy where we understand God has given special revelation to people to write down in an infallible way in text. Okay, all right, well, we're not talking about that. There's other kinds of prophecies. Um, and even the Westminster Confession of Faith uh, pretty much limits prophecy to this divine revelation of truth. Um, but having emphasized the cessation of that kind of prophetic work, we've often missed then other enduring aspects of a prophetic calling that are just as important and that can, can be for us even now more crucial. Okay? Um, 
So building on the foundation of the prophetic scriptures, we discover actually that we are all called to be prophets, not in a sense that we have direct revelation from God as Moses or Peter or, or any of them did or David, but something else. So let me read you. This time I passed out the uh, uh, prophetic portion of our mission statement. I just want to read this paragraph to you first. That way you get it in your mind what it's all about and then show you in the scriptures how this works out. So this is the way we framed it. God the Holy Spirit indwells and leads us as a company of prophets to petition the Father and the Son to change the world and then to declare the judgments of God's counsel to effect that change. Our prophetic calling is largely directed towards the larger world, and that needs to be changed, it's, uh, toward the, the wider world outside the church. As prophets, we are trusted members of God's heavenly council, and that privileged status allows us to petition him on matters that pertain to the administration of his world advise and instruct those who have authority in our community, and boldly speak the life-giving word of God in order to advance the kingdom of God. And I don't want to go into the specifics right now, but I just want you to notice that, that our prophetic calling, uh, as I'm summarizing it here, has two dimensions. It has a God-word dimension in which we petition God to change the world. Prayer. And then a manward direction in which we advise and counsel and consult with those who have authority in the world how to manage the world under the lordship of Jesus. Okay, That's what I want to, I want to show you that in the Bible now. Uh, and none of that is meant to disparage or deny the, you know, the fundamental prophetic understanding that that, all, that men received special revelation from God. But that ceased. That ceased. So we're going to look at seven representative prophets. Um, Abraham, Moses, Amos, then Joseph, and Esther, and Paul. Uh, in the Bible, just these little vignettes, how this works. First of all, Genesis 20. And you can turn here or you can just listen. I'm only going to read a few passages a um, few verses from some of these passages. In Genesis 20, uh, Abraham's wife is taken by Abimelech. <coughs> He's seized by her. And, and I, I want to go into the whole story here, but you remember the story. And in the middle of the night, what happens is that um, God says to Abimelech in a dream, I know that you have done this, in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. In other words, in, in, in the story of Abraham and, and, and Sarah, Sarah has just been told that she's going to give birth to the promised seed. Um, then there's the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then there's this story, right before the birth of Isaac. And so apparently in Satan's plan, Sarah was seized in order to prevent the promised seed to come into the world. And, and, and Abimelech was the one that Satan was using. So God says, I kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you will live. But if you don't return, I know that you will surely die, you and all who are yours. Okay. That's the first occurrence of the word prophet in the Bible. And it, and it comes in connection with God saying that Abraham will pray for you as a prophet, and you will therefore live. So go to Abraham, request that he make petition for you. I will listen to him, and then you will live. Now, Abraham at this point is old. He's been a faithful priest for many years. He's been establishing altars in the land and showing the people of the land how to draw near to God. He's proclaiming the name of God. He's also ruled well. He's defeated the Canaanite kings who captured his nephew Lot in Genesis 14. He's 99 years old. 
He's sinned and he's been forgiven, remember, with uh, Hagar in Genesis 15. The covenant's been renewed by God with him in Genesis 17. And the promise of a son has been given to him. And Abraham is now the friend of God, meaning that God has taken him into his counsel and listens to his advice. This is, this, is, this is well known from the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because God says, um, God says, shall we not tell Abraham what we're about to do? Remember that? And yeah, we're going to tell him what we're going to do. Once God tells Abraham what he's going to do, Abraham then says, okay, well, if you're going to do it, I guess you're going to do it. Is that what he says? No, he says, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. What if there are righteous people and surely you are a God who does right? You're not going to destroy the righteous and the wicked. And remember this whole, this almost bargaining thing where, where Abraham is arguing with God and, and, and God allows that and brings Abraham into his counsel and then takes Abraham its advice. Okay? That's what a prophet does. He is brought into the court of God. God tells him what he's planning to do, and God expects to hear from his junior partner his advice and wisdom. And he listens to his prophet graciously, and then he acts to change the world. Next we have Moses. Moses is a prophet. Deuteronomy 18.15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, Moses says. From your brothers, and it is to him you shall listen. Deuteronomy 18, 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. That's the Lord speaking. And in Deuteronomy 34, 10, listen to what it says. There has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom Yahweh knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and wonders that Yahweh sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh. But notice his face to face reference reminds us that God gave Moses special privileged access to him. Now, a priest has sanctuary access, but this kind of access goes even beyond that. So that Moses spoke boldly and effectively to the ruler of Egypt, Pharaoh. Moses spoke God's judgments, and it changed the world. And it led to the rescue of God's people. So, so that Moses has a face-to-face -face access with God. And then he also has, a, therefore, a kind of authority with others in the world. Okay. You remember the story in, of the golden calf in Exodus 32. Um, in the aftermath especially. Um, so in Exodus 32... Verse 30, the next day, Moses said to the people, you've sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to Yahweh. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to Yahweh and said, alas, this people have sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, Please blot me out of your book that you've written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whatever, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now you go, lead the people to the place which I've spoken to you. And behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord sent a plague. <clears throat> now, uh, then, then there is the story where Moses is making intercession for the people. In, in Exodus 31, and he's arguing with God to, to actually do what he's promised. There's this argument with, with this, this interaction, this discussion with God. Um, if your presence will not go with me, don't bring us up from here. How shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight? I and, your people. So there, there, and I don't want to go into the whole thing, but Moses is face-to-face uh, access means that he's pleading the case of his people and asking God to do things based on his promises. Okay. Now, a lot of that story is fulfilled, of course, in the new Moses, Jesus, who did make atonement for our sin, interceded for us so that God would be gracious to us and make a new covenant with us. But it's, it's also what it means to be a friend of God, 
to have the exalted status of prophet before the Lord God and be able to make your case before him and have him hear you. Next example is Amos. We're just picking representative examples here. Amos in the book of Amos. Um, and at this time, during the, the uh, uh, life of Amos, Israel had progressed and matured from kings to priests and prophets. And particular prophets like Amos revealed to the people their own calling and responsibility before God in regard to the movement of history and God's program in the world. So Abraham is called as a prophet in the last generation of the northern kingdom, about the 8th century B.C. This is the glory days of the southern kingdom's existence. And here's, here's what it says in Amos 3.7. Um, this is part of the commissioning of Amos. For, for Master Yahweh does nothing without revealing his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. Okay? So there the prophets have this special privilege of hearing God's plans, his secrets. That's Amos 3.7. Now, look at, look at what happens. What do, what do the prophets do when that happens? Uh, oh, by the way, um, Jeremiah 23 has something very similar. Uh, Jeremiah, another prophet. Let me read that to you back in Jeremiah uh, because this is helpful too. Jeremiah 23, 16. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with the vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds and not from the mouth of Yahweh. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. Who in heart, they say, no disaster will come upon you. For who, who among them has stood in the counsel of Yahweh? to see and hear his word? Or who has paid attention to his word and listened? But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people. They would have turned them from their evil way. So what happens is the counsel of the Lord includes his trusted advisors, and prophets get to come in on that. That's the idea. Now, in Amos 7, we see what this involves. You know this story. I'll read it to you again. Listen, listen how a prophet responds when God tells him what he's going to do, when he reveals his secret. So Amos says, this is what Master Yahweh showed me. Behold, he was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. And behold, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. And when they had finished eating the grass of the land, all these locusts, I said, well, if it's your will, then go ahead and do it. No. O oh, Lord Yahweh, please forgive. How can Jacob stand? He's so small. So Yahweh repented concerning this, or relented, or changed his mind. It shall not be. So the prophet says, wait a minute. Don't do this. Forgive. Jacob's going to be crushed. And Yahweh changed his mind. Verse 4, this, then this is what Yahweh God showed me. Behold, Master Yahweh was calling for a judgment by fire, and it devoured the great deep and was eating up the land. Then I said, well, your will be done. No. O oh Lord God, please cease. Okay. Think about the, 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 the chutzpah of this. God, stop. <laughs> it's a command. It is, stop. It's an imperative. Stop. <clears throat> How can Jacob stand? He's so small. So Yahweh crushed Amos, killed him for saying such an arrogant thing. That doesn't say that. The Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be. And then there's a plumb line and all the rest. But th this is one of the passages that... And I can't remember when this was. This was years ago when some, somebody in some commentary in some book called attention to this, and then all of a sudden a window was opened, and you began to look at all these places, and prophets always do this. They have access to the counsel of God, and they participate in that privy counsel. 
They're members of a privy council. They participate in it. And then God often listens to what they say and does what they say. It's, re it's remarkable, okay? And that is, if you will, the Godward dimension of our prophetic calling. And it's often left out in job descriptions of prophets. We have the privilege of having, our prophets have the privilege of having the ear of the ruler of the universe, access to the heavenly council, king's friends, advisors. And that's what the church does in corporate prayer. That's what it means when Jesus says, I know you're no longer servants, you're my friends. Okay. Look at the other dimension. And look at the uh, of being a fallible revelation of God to people, but there's, there's something else about it as well that we often miss. First of all, <laughs> priestly Abraham. Generally speaking, Abraham's life is, is priestly. In Genesis. Father Jacob, glory and honor into a pit, and then he's in the household of Potiphar. And just as he's advising his father on what to do with regard to his flocks, he begins advising Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's guard, his praetorian guard, and Potiphar elevates him and get, makes him basically into a friend, into an advisor, puts him in charge of everything. It says he, he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And Joseph didn't try to undermine the Egyptian system with surreptitious, you know, acts of sabotage and, and, and all that, throwing wrenches into things. He's, he, he just faithfully serves this, this leader. He's tempted, he's tested, but he's faithful. It he gets in prison, he's, but he's a faithful prison. In the prison, the prison warden eventually puts him in charge of everything. And we're seeing this pattern here. And the story ends, remember, with Joseph redeeming his brothers, advising Pharaoh, and in effect saving the world. People say, we still have people in seminary, in a certain seminary that I know, that refuses to acknowledge that Joseph is a type of Christ because he's nowhere mentioned in the New Testament. Goodness, Jacob saves the world. Uh, he saves the world with his wise advice about the storage and distribution of food. And everyone knows this one verse from the story of Joseph, where he says, as for you, to his brothers, as for you, you meant it against me as evil, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Okay? Not just Joseph's good, but the good of his brothers, and eventually... The, uh, the tribe of Jacob, all the tribes, and the world. Okay? And the lesson we get from Joseph is that we should not grasp for power and authority. We cannot weasel our way into places of authority in order to instruct rulers about justice and righteousness. We should wait until it's bestowed on us. But the pattern of Joseph also tells us that when we are faithful in little things that seem to get us nothing, nevertheless, faith, power flows to those who are faithful and responsibility flows to them. And so that once you're in this position of power, if you actually give wise advice and you counsel people well, you cons you're a good consultant, then uh, it will go well with you and the people you consult and the, the community that is uh, being affected by all this. And that's, that's really a picture of Christian service in the world. And it's, it's very prophetic. Joseph advises and consults with the ruler of Egypt so that he might know what the correct and wise response is. Second example of this, uh, in, the prophetic, in the prophetic stage of history, in the prophetic corpus, is Esther. She's a great example, and she's meant to be an example to the Jews during their prophetic ministry after the return of the exile. Remember, the Jews are sent out into the nations. The Jews are put under world emperors, 
a new situation. The Jews are, are sent out in all the nations, and they're called to be basically salt and light, which is something they failed at, at least eventually, uh, gloriously failed at. But everyone knows at least one verse from the book of Esther. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Well, come to the kingdom to do what? Well, provide Ahasuerus with wise counsel. What to do? Now, Mordecai is a negative example. Uh, Esther's uncle is a bad example, won't submit to his rightful rulers. God has put these guys over the Jews. He's told them to obey them, but Haman won't bow. Okay? Haman refuses to bow uh, because he's a proud man. There's no reason why he shouldn't bow to Haman. You, uh, bowing is just simply an act of respect for one who's in authority over you. Everybody bows to one another in the Old Testament. Abraham bows to the people of the land. It's just all over the place. There's no, there's no idolatry in that. Now, idolatry comes when you bow before images and dumb idols. But he advises Esther to hide her true identity. Remember this? Hide your identity. And what happens when she hides her identity? Well, the, all of the Jewish community is in danger of being exterminated. That's not what God wants them to do, hide their identity. So these two stupid mistakes almost get the Jews exterminated. And Haman makes advice to Ahasuerus, which he signs into law, the law of the Medes and Persians, which can never be altered. Okay. But Esther then, Esther eventually does her prophetic duty, and she advises the king on what he's to do now, since he wrote this law and he can't take it back. And she eventually saves her people by giving wise advice. Okay. Esther is an example of being the salt of the earth. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, says, You're the light of the world. You're a city set on a hill. You're to let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. This is the, and this is the problem with Israel at the time at the end of the prophetic era, at the time of the first century, the time of Jesus, Israel had, Israel had misunderstood purposefully, not just they, were, they didn't know, but they purposely misconstrued the covenant that God made with them, uh, and they thought it meant that they were alone loved by God. Uh, N.T. Wright describes it like this, Israel was like a postman who thought all the mail in his bag was to him alone. And they forgot that they were not called to condemn the nations, but to bring salvation to the nation as a kingdom of prophets. Mordecai makes this mistake, but eventually Esther writes it. You cannot hide your identity. Okay? It, and by the way, that doesn't mean you have to comment on every error that your boss makes. <laughs> uh, uh, they should know who you are, and they should see your good works, and they should see your service like Joseph, they should see your wisdom like Esther, and then they should then then they will ask you, and you will and you will give them wise advice. The last example of this is, I think, the most powerful and probably best for us as a church to pay attention to, Acts thirteen. I want you to turn there if you have your Bibles, or just listen. Um, I'm going to tell you the story of the Apostle Paul. Um, the Apostle Paul's prophetic ministry. <laughs> can only be understood against the backdrop of the complete failure of the Jews as prophets at the end of, the, of their history in the first century. They are not, at this point, the font of insight and instruction for the Gentile rulers. They counsel injustice. What's the, what's the, what's the prime example of this? Jews counsel rulers injustice. The death of Jesus, the trial of Jesus, okay? Their example is horrendous, okay? They're rebels. They're insurrectionists. That's why the Romans had to put Fortress Antonio on the northwest corner of the temple precincts in Jerusalem to oversee what they're doing because they, they were a bunch of clandestine insurrectionists. And that's not what they were called to do. At the end of the book, at the end of the book of, of uh, Acts, the interaction of the rulers of the Jews with 
Lysias, the Roman uh, soldier, Festus, and then Felix. It's, it's outrageous. They're lying about Paul. All they, all they want to do is try to get Paul killed. They have no interest in justice. What is shocking to us is how the Romans end up being in the book of Acts the source of law and order. And the ones who end up executing justice for Christians in every city. And the Jews are, are the source of lawlessness, riots, roaming bands of assassins, stonings, and more. You can see why Paul, when he says the, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, that's why. The, the Jews even, remember, took a hung, they made a covenant, took a hunger strike, that un, unless they killed the Apostle Paul, they were all just going to die. That's in Acts 22 or 23, I can't remember which. So, that's, that's the context. In Acts 13... Acts 13.1, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger. And now all of a sudden you're getting all these members of, of the court of Herod, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work I've called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. You begin a new chapter in the book of of Acts here. Things are changing. And so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. So they're in Cyprus. And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Pathos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet, Named Bar Jesus, son of Jesus. Okay. Now you have a Jewish false prophet, and he's a magician. This is designed to sum up what the Jew, the behavior and the position of the Jews in the Roman world is like right now. They're like magicians. They're like they're like these fake counterfeit messiahs, a, a son of Jesus, but he's a false prophet. Okay, and if he's a false prophet, and what I've described to you about prophecy is going to be true, what, what are you going to expect? You're going to expect that this guy is going to be in the court of a ruler giving him false and misleading advice. Number, verse 7, he was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, who was a man of intelligence. <laughs> You have a magician, and the Roman is described in glowing terms. He's a man of intelligence. And this guy summons Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, that's just his other name, the Magus. Now, magician, by the way, is, is the English translation of the word magus, which is plural is magi. So it doesn't mean, it doesn't necessarily mean he's a magician in the sense that we understand magicians. He's not like, you know. A Dumbledore or something. Um, <laughs> Magus is, is a term used for wise men who advise rulers. All the wise men that came to visit Jesus from the east, they were exalted uh, philosopher rulers who advised their kings. Well, it was right. So here's this guy. It was a Magus. And he's, he's there opposing them and seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So you have a Jew, a faithless Jew, who's acting as a prophet, but he's doing, he's doing the prophet thing all wrong. And he's like, he's like um, what's his name? Wormtongue in the story of the Lord of the Rings, who, who is, Wormtongue is the advisor of Rohan, remember? The king. And the whole kingdom is... Is, 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 is basically in ruins because you have this worm tongue who is advising the king. And once Gandalf shows up and dispenses with worm tongue, Gandalf advises the king. He rises up. He takes back his kingdom. And everything's restored. Remember that? Well, basically, that's what's going to happen here in the story 
of the Apostle Paul and the Christians. And what's going to happen is in every city, Paul is going to is going to is going to expose the Jews as a bunch of hateful insurrectionists who kick up riots and who stone people for no good reason out of envy. And he's going to leave in every Roman city a Christian community which will end up being wise and eventually change the world to provide wise counsel for the rulers. And, and Paul ends up counseling rulers with wisdom. The Jews end up counseling them to kill Paul, to be murderers. It's an amazing contrast what happens here. is in the Roman Empire, the Jews are being replaced by the Christians. The Jewish prophets, the Maguses, uh, the Magi, are, are, uh, are, are failing big time and are messing everything up. And then slowly what happens is the Christian church comes along and they become the new source, the new voice of of law and order and wisdom and discretion. And that's, that eventually, it takes a couple centuries, but eventually changes. So Saul, who is filled with, Saul, who is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. It is interesting that Paul's name here is changed, uh, and that the uh, proconsul's name is Paul. And again, it probably just tells us this is something about Paul's fundamental calling. He understands what he's doing here. He's not just calling a bunch of individuals to salvation. He's, he's going to change the world. He's, been a, he's going to put into place new counselors, new prophets, who in their manward prophetic duty will bring life to the world, like Joseph, like Esther, okay? or like Daniel. We didn't even mention Daniel. Daniel is one of the greatest examples of this, advising Nebuchadnezzar and then Darius. He is, he is the source of order and life in the Babylonian community. If it wasn't for Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Babylon would <coughs> collapse. That's what's going on. So Paul looks intently at him and says, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. This, this is... <laughs> This is a characterization of the Jews, the apostate Jews. Jesus said, your father is the devil. Paul says, you son of the devil. You enemy of all righteousness. What? The Jews thought of themselves as the champions of righteousness. But Paul says, you're the enemy of all righteousness and justice. That word could be justice as well. Full of all deceit and villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? That's how bad the Jews have become. Everything's twisted. Everything's bent. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. So, Elimus can't lead anybody anymore. Now he has to be led. Now, let me ask you, what does this story sound like? Elimus is blinded and has to be led around by the hand. That language, that explicit language is found in Acts chapter 9. When Paul, the young Magus, the young counselor advising the Sanhedrin about what they should do about the Christians? What was his advice to the Sanhedrin? Kill them. Torture them. Let me go and collect them. The Sanhedrin being the council, the, the ruling council of the Jews. Paul was a magus. Paul was a magician. Paul was a prophet in, in the court of the rulers of the Jews and advised them violence against Christians. Paul was met on the road by Jesus with a blinding light, and was blinded. And it says he had to be led around by the hand. Now, we don't know what happened to Elimus, but it's quite possible that when he, that the Lord saved him. Like Paul, we're not told, we don't know. But it is fascinating that what happens to Elimus is what happened to Paul. And Paul was in the same position that Elimus was. And now Paul is doing what God has called him to do in becoming a true prophet 
And so look what happens. Uh, then the proconsul believed, he trusted. When he saw all that occurred, he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. What that means is <coughs> he started listening to Paul and Barnabas and John Mark. And when Paul and Barnabas and John Mark left, they left behind a new community that would function as advisors and counselors to the proconsul who is now a believer. That is a snapshot of what is going to happen in the whole of the Roman world. It's going to take some time, but it's, this is how it starts. This is, this is the vision of how it starts. Okay. Um, that, to me, is, is one of the examples here. That when you go, and when you, when you, and when you, not just uh, saving individual souls. That, indeed, is happening. That's true. But you are actually bringing in the Christ. It's a soul living. Uh, and that's what's going on in, in the kingdom. And the church has this prophetic role following Paul, <coughs> following Paul's example, has a prophetic role in, the, um, in this new kingdom, especially in advising people. Okay. Um, We could look at Acts 14 and Acts 16, too, where Paul advises. Uh, um, and even at the end of the book of Acts, Paul is in, um, is in Rome. He's under custody. Uh, and the Jews are coming to him. And they're, con they're, still not, they're still not listening. He finally just gives up on them. The Jews have no more place anymore in, this, in the world. Uh, they're apostate, uh, those who haven't come to Christ. Okay, so now let me just uh, take out this sheet now, this last sheet, the prophetic vocation, and let me just say a few things about that, then I'll take some questions and comments. Um, uh, again, I've, dealt, I've done some biblical exposition here, but I haven't talked about a lot of application. So fulfilling our calling, number one, ensure that incess intercessory prayer is a regular part of corporate prayer on the Lord's Day. I think we need to recognize that when we come into God's presence and pray for things, he listens to us. And he changes the way he administers the world based on what we advise him to do. Okay? Um, so we should come with specific prayers about things in this country or things around the world or what missionaries are experiencing in Egypt or something. We, we should ask him, Lord, this is what we want you to do. And expect that he'll listen to us. Now, in his wisdom, he always has um, a way to answer our prayers, which is the best for us. We may not always know what we, what's best for us, but still, we should we should do a lot of intercessory prayer. Secondly, regularly provide instruction and resources, not only the theology of prayer but the practice. Third, regularly provide instruction and resources of ground members in a biblical worldview related to family, culture, entertainment, marriage, civil authority, justice, art, and more. Why? Because when you're out in the world, you need to know how to articulate the Christian position to people who ask you, uh, especially if you're in a position of authority and people listen to you. Four, encourage members to provide biblical, wise Christian advice and counsel when appropriate. Did I say it? When, when appropriate. Okay. I mean, you can, you can, you can be a busybody as a Christian and turn everybody off and always be spouting off. That's not what I'm talking about. When appropriate to colleagues and subordinates, to those in authority at work and in local, regional, state, and national context. Members should, when appropriate, pursue positions of service and influence in their extended families and neighborhoods and schools and service organizations and governments in order to communicate Christian wisdom and support to our culture. Uh, this is where the rubber meets the road. Um, uh, I have, I have a, a men's Bible study that I've uh, taught for almost 22 years now, and some of those guys have been with me the whole time, and we're all getting old. Um, um, and I'd say half of the guys now are, 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 have retired from their work, from, their, from the work they've been doing, whether it's a, uh, a corporate uh, position or whether it's insurance or retail uh, shoes or whatever it is, you know, whatever they do, they, a lot of them have retired from that and they become consultants. 
this is kind of what happens in our life is, you know, we, we're children, we learn all the rules, then we, we're adults and we work, we get married, we, and we're actually active. And then in a later time in our lives, we become consultants. Not necessarily officially consultants, but everybody kind of comes to us for advice. And if we're, if we're, um, lucky is not the word, if we're fortunate enough, then companies will actually hire us because we've had, we have experience and it's our words. It's our words that make a difference. Now, not what we do, but what we say. And what we say then helps younger men or younger women actually do their work more efficiently and more wisely and more whatever, more productively. Uh, but it's, it's, our, it's our words. And that's prophetic. That's a prophetic calling. And as we grow in whatever vocation we're in, if we're known to be Christians, and if our behavior has been appropriate, not just like perfect, and, but our behavior has been consistent, then people will ask us advice. Okay? So now, for example, I've been a member of this press period for 22 years. I'm talking about the press period in Missouri. And uh, I'm getting to be older. I've been around for a while. And so now I'm finding it very kind of uncomfortable that I'm, people are coming to me for advice. I'm just not comfortable with that. It's like, hmm. Do I, I still think of my, we, we just talked about this, I still think of myself as being in college sometimes, you know, physically. It's like, I'm not in college anymore. This kind of proves it right there. Um, <laughs> um, but, I mean, you have to get comfortable in that, that station of your life where you start giving advice. Um, and as Christians, I think we, we haven't spent much given much attention to that. I mentioned... Uh, James Davison Hunter's book, To Change the World, and how his bottom line was faithful presence. I think sometimes the way he articulates is a bit too abstract and kind of sky, but faithful prophetic presence. You're, you're present there, but you're also, you're also able to communicate when appropriate what's best for the company or the family or the city or the county or whatever. Or, or, or whatever society you're a part of, okay? See this happening in, in the gun club, which I'm a member of. Um, try to advise. There are a number of Christians who are at top level match directors. I was a match director for a while for a pistol competition shooting. And you try to behave in a way that's Christian. And you try to give advice about when issues come up that's consistent with the faith. And it leads people into a safer and a more productive way of running the club. That's just the way you do it. I think, I think more than anything else, our country continues to, well, continues to be fairly consistent and ordinary normal uh, in terms of Christian culture because there are so many Christians that are just spread out into all sorts of vocations. I mean, I, st I still hear, even in the public school system in St. Louis, about all the Christians who are still teaching. Well, you know, I don't know that I could do that, but I give thanks that there's somebody there. I mean, otherwise, it would all just, well, maybe it's about time that it should collapse and crumble. But um, it, it, I, I think the, the way that the, the world is still running and the, America is still running like it is because of so many Christians who are living their lives and also giving good advice and largely followed by people. That's, that's prophetic. Um, so then the fifth thing is we should seek out ways to communicate that, the wisdom of scripture to leaders in the community. That's our prophetic location. Okay, a few minutes. Any, any questions on anything? I appreciate you guys have been very patient and good about listening um, to three hours on Saturday morning. It's still amazing to me. I would have I would have been out to the range today. <laughs> Any questions about that? Priests, prophets, king. Uh, I also gave to you a, an Acts diagram, which kind of shows how uh, the book of Acts flows out from priestly to royal to prophetic. If you want to put that up on a tree and shoot at it, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it is a nice bullseye. Hmm. 
Okay. Nothing? Nothing? No disagreements? Everything was right? True? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. I hope this was helpful for you. Let me, let me, let me close.